What's up and welcome. I'm Aaron Fisher and I'm here with Adam, Alex, and Steve from Conjure Community, the world's best magic club. In today's video, you'll get a taste of what a great magic club can offer you. So please do us a favor. If you like what you see, hit the like button and also the subscribe button to this channel. So you'll be notified every time we go live with a hot new video like the one we're about to do today. Adam, tell the people what we're going to do today. I want to defer to Alex today because Alex put together this wonderful, wonderful show for us, which I'm so excited. Alex, tell us what we're about to do. Well, we're about to venture into the territory of one of the greats, just recently passed, will always be remembered, the great Johnny Thompson. Some wonderful magic that I think still is, it's, it, these clips are older, but you look at them now and I think all of the magic is just as strong now as it was then. And I think it's, uh, I think that's about all I need to say. I think it's pretty awesome. I think we're all going to have a great time watching this magic because it's so strong and so good. Yeah. John was, uh, John was our teacher and our friend. And this is the stuff that we would show to introduce you to him, right? We loved you and we wanted you to see the best. I think the first clip, if you're all ready to go, Adam, feature a little trick called the egg bag. It's a nice trick name, right? Because it doesn't give away the trick. Doesn't give away the trick. <laughs> it's not like yeah, a the floating lady on the string, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. How is this looking? Can everybody see that? Oh, oh, oh whoops. Oh, that's here. not it. No. no. Let's try no. that again. <laughs> here like we go. And broadcasting the set list. This is much better. How's that? Is that it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now we're in. Here we go. Hey, footage, get, bro. Get ready for this. An eight-year-old boy in school auditorium saw a magician come out. He showed the egg, showed the bag, placed the egg inside the bag, turned the bag inside out. The egg had disappeared. Actually, it was here in his hand. Wasn't a great trick, but then you must remember he did not have the sophisticated observing group I had before me tonight. He had a bunch of seven and eight-year-olds. A few years later, though, I saw another magician perform the trick, and he was in Athens, Greece. I was on a USO tour, and I was 18 years old. He came out and said, Karis ke kari kalisperesis, which is good evening, ladies and gentlemen. He said, I would like to perform a feat of taki dati lorhia, which is Greek for sleight of hand. He said, to do this, I used two objects, makri mavri sakula, a little black bag, and theano avogo, and one egg. He said, I placed the egg in the bag in a manner so as not to deceive you had the same lines as the first guy. Actually, he did the same thing, except he had one other wonderful move. Behind the bag, and I'll move the bag away so you can see this, he would tuck the egg deftly up under the front of his vest. Now, it was his move. I don't do it so well, but he did it marvelously. And he used to turn the bag inside out at the same time. Now, when you do the trick like this, you must stand extremely still. Of course, he was 97 years old. That's all he could do is stand extremely still. <laughs> When he was ready to retrieve the egg, he would turn the bag right side out, shake the bag violently, at the same time ease the egg out from under his coat. Then he would come over the bag, allow the egg to fall in, then show his hands empty, reach into his pocket, say magico pundera, which is Greek for woofel dust, magic powder. And then he would say something very strange. He would say, voila. That's French, he was Greek, very strange, and he would reproduce the egg. <laughs> Both of the magicians I told you about cheated. I do also, but only a little bit, so you must watch very closely. Now, to do this, I need the help of two ladies from the audience. Would you two mind coming up? That's why... I'd just like to say, though, right here, is that it's pretty unbelievable that he did that long of an intro on television, you know? Is, is this the first time y'all have ever seen John really do the egg bag formally without playing Tom Sony overtly? Yeah. Well, I don't think I've ever seen it, the whole thing start to finish like this beginning. Like I've seen him do it in the middle of the Thomasonia. Yeah. I mean, I think, right. I think during the entire time we knew him and for many years before he did the Thomasonia act on stage. And then when he would do close up, he would be John Thompson. Now I have seen him in a private home at a hoity toity Canadian party with these Magicana people here. I've seen him do the egg bag as himself but he was really being Tom Sony. It had been so long since it's been in his act. He was being Tom Sony. So this is watching a time when John Thompson would do magic on stage as John Thompson, which I, I've never seen any clips like that before. 
Yeah, I was yeah. fortunate that in the 90s, I got to see John at a convention and he did the Tom Sony act Him and Pam were there and they did the full Tom Sony act in the evening show. But in the daytime, they had these sessions where they were, it was close up magic and there were rooms and these magicians would go room to room like a normal old school magic convention. And that's when I saw John for real because I had seen the Tom Sony act on TV at that point. I knew who he was. But when I saw him do close up, I was not prepared. I saw him do the I saw him do the hundred dollar prediction, saw him do the egg bag and all these things. It was like I, I felt like I was like punched in the gut because it was just so strong and like I couldn't believe that magic could be that good. And this this routine is it. This is what I saw that first time. So good. I sort of envy you, Steve. <laughs> I we stuck you on the end of the chairs over there. Would you step here and uh, you just cross around over here and I'll kind of sneak between you. Right over here. What is your name? Brenda. May I call you Brenda? Sure. What time, Brenda? I move very <laughs> anyway. quickly. Good girl. And your name? Kirsty. Hi, Kirsty. That's a very un Are you thirsty, Kirsty? No. <laughs> a very unusual name. Kirsty, do you sew? No. Do you no. sew? Well, then I'll explain this to you. This bag is sewn with a seam that's called French seaming. You'll notice there are no raw edges. You'll also notice there's no holes, trap doors, hidden pockets, or slits on the outside of the bag. But all of the magic happens on the inside. And so since you girls don't sew, I'll explain this to you. It is seamed on three sides, has an opening here. That's why they call it a bag. Well, you don't know when they don't sew. Would you reach inside and pull the bag inside out, Kirsty? Now, would you examine that? Because all the magic happens on the inside. Are there any openings, trap doors, hidden pockets? Do the seams come apart? Any place I could hide it? Nothing, no. All right, I will show you the right side of the bag again, or the outside. By the way, in my pocket, in this pocket, I have the egg, which is a real egg, or I should say an egg shell, if you notice. The hole, there's a little hole there, and the contents have been removed through that to protect the innocent, your garments. Mm -hmm. Once again, your name is? Brenda. You didn't forget. Yes. Good, Brenda. <laughs> Would you hold on to the egg? Now, I am going to turn this right side out, as I said. There is the outside. Would you examine it? Are there any openings, trap doors, hidden pockets? Nothing. Looks no just like the inside, except it's back on the outside. Now, you've seen the inside, the outside, the centers, and the seams. You've seen the egg. Watch closely. Is there any doubt the egg went in the bag? No, it's there. Can you see the snow white egg in the black interior of the bag? Yeah. Can you feel it resting on the palm of my hand? Mm -hmm. Would you hold your hand palm upward like this, Kirsten? Just as the shifting sands of the Sahara Desert Vanish into the night's trade wind, so doth the egg disappear from my fingertips. Pretty stuff. <laughs> Not the trick, the poetry. Oh. <laughs> A lot of people think I hide it somewhere within the folds of the bag. I assure you I do not, but let's check nonetheless. Can you feel the egg inside the bag? Can you feel it? No. Nope. Look in there. Can you see the snow white egg in the black nope. interior of the bag? Would you reach inside? Would you pull the bag inside out? I will tease and tantalize the corners. I don't know what that means, but all the magicians say that. There are no openings, no trap doors, no hidden pockets on the inside. Let's check the outside once again. Perhaps, just perhaps, it's up the magician's proverbial sleeve. Take your right hand, hold on to my left wrist. Don't allow anything to fall out. Don't let go, but allow me freedom of movement. Would you do the same with your left hand? Now, ladies. A beautiful ring. Does yeah. that come with batteries? <laughs> would, would you spread out? Yeah. Make it look like a big act. Now, this doesn't mean Make much, but this is 26 years professional show business experience. Shows the bag empty and my hands empty in one move. 26 years, watch. Mm -hmm. Yay. So, I gotta tell you, after 26 years, the bag tastes terrible. <laughs> Don't let go of the, the, the wrist, but with the other hand, would you reach inside? Can you feel the egg inside the bag? No. Look in there. Can you see the snow white egg in the black interior of the no. bag? Would you reach inside? Can you feel the egg inside the bag? Look in there. Can you see that snow white egg in the black interior of the bag? No. Nothing in my hand. No. Voila. It was good enough for the Greek. It's good enough for me. Watch closely. The egg. That is not the end of the act, <laughs> as you can tell by the lack of applause. <laughs> no. But you will know. They are, the, the audience here, by the way, they are, like, his jokes are not connecting with this audience at all, you know? But that handling, like, Johnny Thompson's classic handling of this trick is as clean as it gets. Like, it, that, it looks like the bag is empty in every way, shape, form. Like, there's just no doubt sitting here. If I was up there, I would be so sure. 
Even sitting here, I'm sure. Totally fooled. Danny Goldsmith says, I'm fooled. Yes. It's going to be really interesting for everybody when you see how John's humor on stage was uh, evolved when he adopted the Tom Sony character. So everyone just keep in mind, you know, John's manner of performing, how the jokes are playing and all that stuff, because you're going to get to see an incredible case study here in uh, a man finding his voice. Oh, that's all right. I don't beg for it. I'll openly ask you in a minute. You may let go of me. Would you hold on to the egg? You noticed, Kirsty, that I held the bag between my two fingers and thumb. Would you hold out your first two fingers of each hand, stick them on the inside of the bag, thumbs on the back, hold on to it, good girl. I will perch the egg atop the bag, like so. Ask you to tilt your hands with the angle of the floor because we're in a residential district and it does tip. I don't know what that has to do with it, but I always say it. Can you see the egg? <laughs> You have the same view. We can't keep meeting like this. People are getting suspicious. You have the same view as I do. If I were to do anything, you would know. I'm going to turn back my sleeve, walk over there, grab the egg, throw it exactly 15 feet into the air. Before it hits the ceiling, it will disappear. And you won't see how it's done. Are you ready? Follow me. One, two, Three, gone. Now, I know the first thing you think of when you see that, you may let go, is, is that it's somewhere within the, the bag itself. I assure you, and I'll re-tease and tantalize the corners. Nothing on the inside, no openings, no holes, no trap doors, no hidden pockets. Let's check the outside once again. Perhaps, just perhaps, it's somewhere within the folds of the bag. Would you reach inside? Can you feel the egg inside no. the bag? Look in there. Can you see the snow white egg in the black interior of the bag? Would you reach inside? Can you feel the egg inside the bag? No. Would you hold on to the bag? Two fingers and thumbs. We're going over here a little bit. While I'm standing here, a good five and a half to six feet away, Brenda and I, would you look inside that bag, Kirsty? Can you see the snow white egg in the black interior of the bag? Seriously. No. Right, hold on tightly with your right hand. Let go with your left and wave your left hand in the air so they can see there's nothing in there. Don't move a muscle. Now, while I've been standing here, you've looked and felt in that bag and there is no egg, correct? Correct. Don't move a muscle. Slowly, with your left hand, reach into that bag and take out what you find. Be careful. It's a real egg. <laughs> Thank you very, That's the moment very much. Right there. This guy. Look at that guy. Johnny Thompson. Like, hey, no. Is that, that Mark, is that was that Mark Wilson? No, no, he's like a Canadian host of that. I hey, forget what that show's called, but he wears gloves in all the scenes I've ever seen of him. He's wearing white or black gloves. It's, we uh, got to go back to those tuxedos like that, man. Yo, does, all of those did he clothes. change? Did, did Johnny change his routine? I don't remember that middle that the the section where he has her hold it and he reaches in and turns the bag inside out. Is that an older piece that he replaced later on? No, that's in, no, that's all standard. All that's in the book, even like that. Yeah. That routine is in the book, just like that. It's but as a, as a practical matter, you know, the the egg bag, like the billiard balls, is one of these uh, routines where you end up having an overage of you know ten phases and shows and displays that end up on the cutting room floor. And it's I think rather odd, actually what Alex is saying, which is that the actual routine as it appears in the book, which was published just the last couple of years, right? Yeah. Is actually the exact met, uh, the exact phases and throw offs we're seeing right now. Right. Yeah. It's clear that those things are honed because there's those displays that he has in there are taking the work of Vernon and, you know, and, and Malini and basically elevating it to a point where he's got new subtleties that I've never seen anybody else do except for Johnny. And it's, it's a masterpiece, in my opinion. I think that's the best egg bag routine that there is. I'm Get surprised that I'm surprised how how much when I say filler, I don't really mean that in a bad way. But there's just a lot of other stuff. I'm kind of surprised by that. He came out, told a long story before he did anything. Then he did something. Then he put a big, long interaction in there that didn't seem to really go anywhere. But you know, but it still holds together. You know what I mean? But it's a middle piece. I think when yeah. I saw him, I mean, he came out and he established, I'm Johnny Thompson, here's magic, right? And then it was like, all right, now that we're here, we're going to do a little magic. Now I'm going to show you this as a classic of magic. And then yeah. he tells the story of seeing it as a kid and seeing it as a young adult. 
and then going into it. And I think all of those things, they all need to be there. All those, nece- all those things are necessary because it's like, I'm not doing these things that these guys did. So watch close. And it's like, it's, I think it's the equivalent of like that Slidini coin routine that we were watching uh, Michael do where it's like, you're going from six coins down to four coins, down to two coins, down to one coin so that they are at this wide of attention. And then they slowly come into that point of being right there with you. And they know that there's no way and it makes the magic Mm. that much stronger. Right. So I think all of those gambits are there for that, to create that, that air. And it's a very, it's a very interesting thing, Steve, you know, again, John, John does all these jokes, but when John becomes the Polish press digitator, Oh, I know he becomes the joke because him reacting to his material. I mean, he's playing this absurd yeah. character against the jokes and the people and that sort of. Let me just say one more thing too. Stuff. It This is the vid clip we're looking at here. The egg bag has got to be like, early 70s late 60s mid mid 70s yeah mid 70s mid 70s okay so things are different because the real change in video and television happens in the 80s where things are really starting to move a lot faster and you know people's attention spans are getting crushed and so this kind of an act that could totally i mean we've all watched acts of older magicians and we go like wow that's you know it's so deliberate and so you know uh, I, I really don't want to use negative words because I love them. I love a lot of them, but I don't know how well they. Play well, it was that. a different. It was a different a different time. time yeah, I, I would I'm say though, religion. for the benefit of our members, you should uh, check out the Scott Alexander living room lecture because mm-hmm. Scott's uh, got a uh, a lot on this egg bag, and it's an incredible thing to see. In addition, Scott's got a lot on this topic that Alex and Steve were talking about. You know, on things like how how you can do things that we might imagine would not play for a large room these days, uh, such as a small trick like a torn and restored cigarette paper uh, and how you can use uh, showmanship essentially to make uh, things like that play as big as they did when Nate Leipzig them in vaudeville. Uh, shall we carry forward? I believe so. Uh, so this next clip, Alex, this is the this is Johnny doing the cups and balls. You want to preface this, or should we just jump right in? We should just jump right in. It's cups and balls, but it's it's a strong one, and I don't want to gush too much. We should just watch the thing. Terrific, terrific Game audience we've got here at the Magic Palace. And yeah, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, we happen to have a terrific entertainer for you right now. He's going to do some Speaking close that up middle magic part, for man, you. I used to and rock me, the he's part, terrific at it. Would you please welcome from Hollywood, Mr. John Thompson. <laughs> used to rock that feathered back, you know what I'm saying? That's yeah. that's from a different time. <laughs> that showbiz John, y'all. There he is. Thank you. I have at my sides, Chris, is it Christina? Christine. Christine and Marge. Marge. They're from the audience, and we just Marge. expedited things by having them up here quickly. I'm going to perform a very old piece of classical magic. There are some sugar cubes. Would you take two, and would you also reach across and take two? We'll put the rest back inside here. You have your two? You have your two. I'll put this away. May I have these? That's one. That's two. Three and four. Watch very closely. This was called chinka chink. Chinese in origin. And I will do it very slowly. And the only magic words I will say is chinka chink. Watch carefully. Chinka chink. Sometimes it doesn't always start off correctly. Chinka chink. You have to get them going for a second. Here we go. Chinka chink. I'll do it once again. Watch. It gets harder because you pay more and more attention. Watch. This is the hard way. It's called the bank shot. Watch. Chink a chink. Chink a chink. One, two, three. For the record, he's doing that the hard way. Mm. Yeah. Are, are you talking about are you talking about the sugar content? Because there's no Splenda. No, I know. No, I'm just talking about the palm. Mm. There's yeah. No room for no room. John stacked those cubes up, man. They look like casino checks. 
Like, look at John's hand, you know. When I met John for the first time in 1997, he was an older guy, had the same hair, wore shirts the same way. And I felt like I was with some character out of, like, Casino, the movie, you know. Do you remember? Did you feel that way, Adam, even when you met him? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, he, like, I don't know if you ever got, I never really got, like, John even hang out personally with him when he was not on when he was not just always on like personality turned on you know so i don't know i mean actually uh i don't think it has an origin in chinese culture i think it has an origin in xenophobic culture during a time <laughs> during a time when uh, people routinely you know uh theo bamberg right was a dutch jew playing the role of a chinese magician Exactly. Right? So that's Okido, right? And then his son, David Bamberg, was a Dutch Jew playing the role of a Chinese magician speaking Spanish in South America. Right? <laughs> so that's that's the history of uh, Oriental conjuring at that time, you know? Maybe, and maybe that word wasn't so racist back then. I don't know. Here we go. Well, certainly not relative to everyday conceptions <laughs> you may keep those ladies oh great yeah. you get to keep them wonderful this is an even older <laughs> mystery this is the oldest magic trick in existence that shirt it's called the cups and balls Badass. i'm just showing you the cups in a second i will add the balls the trick has been done with goblets paper cups dixie cups chinese tea cups these happen to be copies or uh, replicas of 17th century drinking goblets would you look inside there is there anything in there say no no good is there anything in there say no, no. we kind of show the camera as well and also this one is there anything in there now they used to judge a magician's skill by how well he did this and i see i've been in a lot of trouble i forgot to close the trap doors you probably think I'm kidding, but if I don't, Christine, you see what happens? One falls right through the other. So let me tighten them up a little bit like so, and I'll tighten <laughs> this one up, see? Then they won't fall through one another. Of course, if I don't tighten this one up, Marge, you know what happens? The other one falls right through it. So let me tighten it also. Now, you're going to have to pretend you don't know about the trap doors. Now, uh, you need a magic wand for this, and we spare no expense here at the Dale Harney Show, and I mean no expense whatsoever. <laughs> You may see these misused in clothes closets here in this country, but this is a ma Polish magic wand. You ought to see what we hang our clothes on. Anyway, along, by the way, the beginning. I don't know if you can, on camera, I'm sure you can see, these look deeper on the inside. You see this? Deeper on the inside than they really do on the outside. It's an interesting optical illusion. Can you see that? Looks deeper on the inside. I will prove it. You see? It measures almost two inches deeper on the inside than it does on the outside. Of course, I never argue because that's how the trick is done. Now, along with this, you need crochet-covered balls. Now, because we have three cups, we will use three crochet-covered balls. One, two, three. I've got several there lines There have been many there. great, great <laughs> cup and ball workers, and I'm going to deal with only those of the 20th century. Probably the finest one died in 1946. His name was Max Mullaney. Max Mullaney was a Russian Jew. Short, fat, squat, wore courtly dress, velvet frock coats, <laughs> blossomy shirts and vests, brocade vests, performed before all the crown heads of Europe. Had this very deep Russian Jewish accent, and I will try and give you an example of what Max, Max's work was like. My name is Max Bellini, ladies and gentlemen. I will do a very good trick for you. What is your name, my dear? Marge. Very good, and your name? Christine. Very good, Christine. You always laugh when you say your name. Christine, are you right or left-handed? Right. Put your right hand on top of the cup like so. I have two other cups. Marge, which one would you like me to do the trick with? Yeah. That one there. Watch closely. I'll show you nothing. The hands I rub them together, put the one here. Remember, my name is Max Malini. I'm going to do a miracle. I place the ball under the cup. Tap. Put your finger back on top. Lift the cup, lift the cup. Darndest thing you ever see, my dear. You've done with that. Oh, oh, so much fun to watch. I do it again. Watch, we use this cup the first time. Now we're going to use this one. Watch very closely. Show you there's nothing in the hands. Watch. Underneath, we do that one, two, lift the cup, please. Darn the thing. Stop this here, man. 
That's awesome. Is, is it me that just watching John handle the routine, the most basic, simple parts of it, when I, I, I felt this as a child when I'd look at things and I feel it now, just watching the way he makes the ball go from one cup to another feels magical. The way he puts the cup down, the way he moves from here to here, the way he taps just the precise tempo at which he does it and the way it feels and looks and reads. Do y'all feel like it's a more magical experience independent of the effects, independent of the balls appearing, disappearing? I'm embarrassed to say I've never seen this. You've never seen him do the cups and balls. I've never seen what I, what'd, you, what'd you say? I've never seen this. I've never, I've seen, never seen this so young. What I really like about it is the way he's doing it, it's almost like it's happening in her hands, right? The way, here's the cup, put it down, put your face. It's like almost like, it's like taking it right to the spectator. You're you saying know? it's like a ball in a cup in your hand. It almost it's is, awesome. but it's on the table, right? I'm trying this, to do my shirt the way I used to, John used to do you it. Need to, you stuff. need to stop shaving. You got to have the, you know. You know, back in those days, we used to, I, we used to wear like a purple sport coat and pull the collar out. And went, oh, we, yeah. We were, oh, we, that's hot. We were living the, with a oh, of Grizzly yeah. Adams, you know. I mean, I don't think I ever, but I, I don't think I ever buttoned the top two ever. I was looking, you know? to, I wanted to go out like pig pen. Okay. All right. That, just this, this base, by the way. Uh, John is the only person I've ever seen do this. I, I hadn't seen this TV performance before the books and the books were the first place that I saw this routine. Uh, and this first phase is actually Malini's phase. He does it as Malini, but it's never been in print. This is the first time that this phase has ever been in existence and it's an elegant thing. And I don't think, I think that's the reason why we've never seen anybody else do this like this. Because the one this, we just saw or the one we're about to see? This, this whole phase where he's doing it, where she puts her finger on the back of the cup, that whole phase while he's talking as Max Malini, that's new. That's never been out for magicians. That's never been in existence for magicians to, to recognize. And for those of you who are technically minded, you know, John lifts both cups whenever he wants and then quick as a pee, they're right back in there. I've never seen anyone do that so naturally and beautifully in my life. It's like magic. Here is the last one. Rolls very closely. Right from the hand, like this. Go on, lift the cup, my dear, lift the cup. Darn this thing. <laughs> that was Max Bellini. There was another gentleman who used some uh, pass. Each one of these phases is called a pass. I will do another pass for you. This is Gayot's pass, 17th century magician, but it was performed by a 20th century magician named Pop Krieger. Pop Krieger was a New Yorker, had a heavy Jewish accent, and he performed like this. Hello, my name is Pop Krieger. What's your name? Mark. You didn't forget, good. What's your name? Wow. You didn't laugh. All right, Christine. <laughs> Watch very closely. It's a very wonderful trick. Done with three cups. One, two, three. Watch very closely. I take the ball like this. Watch the ball go, one, <laughs> two, and I've only been doing it two weeks, my friend. Watch closely, I'll do it again. Second ball, it's gone, one, two. I do it one more time, watch closely. Here's the last one. I know what you're thinking. You say it's not here, it's already over there. Right, much? <laughs> say yes, sir. Good girl. I didn't do it. Really, there's nothing here. You can see that. Absolutely. Watch. I do it one more time. Watch very closely. Down this thing you ever see. One, two, three. Thank you very much. Uh, Adam? Yeah. I was just like my Uncle Albert. You just heard a legit Yiddish accent. That, <laughs> that was it, wasn't it? Totally what all of the jokes are supposed to sound like. That's exactly how it works. Isn't it funny? Did you hear a little bit of that? Uh, eh, get out of here, kid. You probably, w. C. Fields was in there. A little <laughs> bit, well, you know? Plus, the he sounded a little time, like he was from Wallachia. The last time we hung out with Johnny before he passed away, that whole night he was doing voices. Like constantly, he was doing impressions of people, and um, I didn't realize that he had incorporated that into his into his act. He had such a gift for mimicry 
I mean, I think when we get to see, he's going to do the dove, you're going to, we're going to show the dove act, right? So when you watch John do stage magic, the first many minutes, 10 to 15 minutes of the show, he doesn't hardly say anything, but he's playing the character the whole time. If you got to see him for an hour, then he starts to talk and the entire thing is in the Polish press, the digitator, you know, he is doing the whole thing. So uh, he's clearly using this gift of mimicry all the way through it as it's becoming more and more apparent to him how much of the, of the, of the chicken fat in the show is coming from these characterizations, right? The chicken fat. Yeah, well, to use a Yiddish uh, I feel you. fattener. You know, you call it Crisco. Yeah. Thank you. White people. Another marvelous performer who's still alive, 85 years old. He's the dean of magicians. His name is Di Vernon. Di Vernon, at 85, is probably still one of the most marvelous performers, and he works something like this. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Di Vernon, and, and there must be a few magicians out there that recognize my voice. And anyway, what I'm going to do is an old Egyptian trick. Watch very closely. What is your name? Christy. Very good. And yours? Marge. I'll take a guess. Thank you, my dear. Watch closely. One, two, three cups, nothing in the hands. I take the ball away from the cups altogether. Watch it. It disappears like magic. I'll do it one more time. Keep your eye on it. Second one right here, gone before your very eyes. I'll do one more. Watch very, very closely. Last one. Did you see it go? Interestingly enough, they always jump back to their own little houses. One, two, three. Thank you very, very much. And that classic Die Vernon uh, is, is it not, it's not actually Vernon's phase at all because Vernon uses a slightly different method of vanishing the, the balls. But it's funny because, uh, you know, you don't really notice that. I mean, he, he, he's adopted that, that he's taken on Vernon so well there that you would almost guess that's exactly how Vernon would perform it. I don't know if any of y'all have a problem watching the cups and balls like a regular person, but there are some tricks, right? That your magic awareness, your overlay just pops on like captions in a movie. You know, you're just, it's hard to watch it just from the audience perspective because you're, you're seeing basically like dashes, you know, you're seeing the transparent layer underneath everything. When he does that phase, that, that, that core simple phase of three balls disappear, three balls come back again, Never had such a feeling watching it. Like each one that was gone was really gone. Like it was out of play and done because it was gone. So it really looked like he took one, two, three. It was like watching Danny Goldsmith make a coin disappear or something. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what else too? You know, I noticed here Johnny Thompson not afraid to use the same slight, the same vanish yeah. over and over and over again. And a lot of people would stress about that, like in their show, making sure that their vanishes are different and unique for each phase and stuff. It just goes to show, you know, if you've got the uh, if you've got this, if you've got this persona and you've got the story, you've got the attention. You don't have to have different versions of that. Well, plus he had two other things. He had a perfect slight, three things. Perfect slight, perfectly motivated, perfectly misdirected, and a structure to set it all up. So, but the thing is, also, he made them vanish like it was one phase, didn't he? Yeah. So it yeah. really did feel like it was boop, boop, boop. You know, it didn't really feel like one trick belabored. Now let's do another one. Oi, <sighs> you know. Oi. I, I hope we get an oi out of him. Have you time. ever heard a person invoke? the concept of a jewish accent twice in their tv show never i mean present company excluded never thank you now uh, i'm gonna stand and uh, do another phase and this is a phase a dear friend of mine charles earl miller charlie miller's a little heavy set looks like this <laughs> Hi, Charlie Miller, hi. And Charlie doesn't use the cups at all. What Charlie does is he takes them and he puts them out of play altogether. He puts one here in his back pocket, you see. Then what he does is if he's taken one away, he'll take a second one away, you see. That will only leave one over here, you see. Keep your eye on it, watch very, did you see this one come back over here? I cheat, but only a little bit, so you must watch closely. When I put it back over here, you're watching me fumble with my pocket. In reality, it jumps from over there to over here, you see. <laughs> How many are over here? Do you recall, Marge? 
Tough None. question? No, no, there's, there, there's one there. <laughs> You'll have to take my word on it. Watch. Was there one there a second ago? Yes. There sometimes is three, but it really doesn't matter. One, two, three. That's the way Charlie Miller does. <laughs> Now, there's one other gentleman, and his name was Dr. Jacob Daly. And Dr. Yeah. At this point, I don't want to interrupt the flow, but at this point in Charlie Miller's life, he's living with John and Pam Thompson <laughs> in, in, the, in an apartment over the garage. And so John would come back from doing shows and events, and, and he would literally come off the road and then go session with Charlie all night, you know. And he, Charlie Miller was notoriously secretive guy right john found the way to put charlie in a mood to to be sharing with him all the time which is that he he did room and board for him and pam totally supported that she let that happen and for anyone who knows i mean alex and adam both have wonderful relationships in, in their uh, life, which involve uh, ladies who have had to put me up for months on end. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, can't wait to come to your house, Steve. <laughs> so we had just watched this uh, wonderful uh, phase. Let's get back into it. We've just seen how Charlie Miller did it. Now we're into Jacob Daly's method. We may want to rewind this bit and watch the last phase again if you want. Dr. Jacob Daly had a most unusual way. He would take all the balls. Now, he could do this, by the way, with the balls on top or with them underneath. When he did it with them on top, he put all three in his pocket. Whatever one you touch, they will appear underneath. I guarantee it. With a wand. Oh. It's all right. No? Try another one. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. <laughs> no, it really doesn't matter. You see, this is the first one you touched, was it? See, I could make it appear underneath there. I mean, it's really no problem whatsoever. <laughs> Gets a little bigger, you see. But Jacob Daly, when he did this, he had a wonderful thing. You didn't believe there were trap doors. Look, it goes right on through the darn trap door. I'll do it once again. Look at that. Isn't that the darnest thing we've ever seen? People say, how can you do that? I said, simple, you cheat. Do you know how, do you know how this is done? It's simple, you use four of these things. The only way it happens each and every time. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Did you see that bit where he said, you know, sometimes he places it on top, other times he places it underneath. Right. <laughs> he's getting ready to make oranges appear. He's not going back to any secret spot. He's not doing any more by play with his pocket. He's got everything is beautiful and he, and he has all well, that. He did one more load. He had those three on the table and did the whole thing and showed his hands empty, then grabbed yeah. the whole stack and did the load. It was really elegant. Yes, but that's a separate elegant, beautiful thing. I'm talking about before when he's got it, them all loaded and he says, hey, you can go on top. Sometimes it goes underneath. It's an, another example of whatever he's doing there. It's the same thing he was doing before. He can just pick up those balls and it really just looks like he's picking up those cups and putting them back down. And it's... If y'all want to know what, what we mean when we say natural born mechanic, you know, Johnny was a show person. He was a real showman, but he had the heart of a mechanic. And as we talk about all the time, the goal was not to make it look like he could do a lot of skillful stuff. The goal is to make it look like magic and that he wasn't doing anything sneaky. And it really comes across, you know, I kind of, I don't know. I don't know how our timing is, but I kind of want to watch that sequence again from charlie miller on do you guys think that would be fun sure uh yeah yeah it was the char it was the charlie miller uh how charlie miller so you look for him to do his charlie He's very interesting right that he is embedded in the middle of his routine about the greatest magicians of all time he's included his living teachers right so he's talking about Di vernon and charlie miller because he's going to go home to him. They're going to see his appearance. You know, they're going to... Which, which sequence? Where do you want to start it, Aaron? It's literally uh, two back, right? Because we just had this final sequence where the four uh, Tangelos or whatever appeared. And then before that, he was talking about how Charlie Miller would can confuse you by placing balls in his pocket and having him jump back. So it's the loading sequence there. 
basically okay. that whole loading. Hey, screen. this is YouTube. We don't like want to, you know, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My Ooh. name is Di Vernon, and, <laughs> and there must be a few peers like magic. This is a dear friend of mine, Charles Earl Miller. Charlie Miller's a little heavy set. Looks like this. <laughs> Hi, Charlie Miller. Hi. But these are some of the best. And Charlie doesn't use seen. the cups at all. Gosh. What Charlie does is he takes them and he puts them out of play altogether. He puts one here in his back pocket, you see. Then what he does is if he's taken one away, he'll take a second one away, you see. That will only leave one over here, you see. Keep your eye on it. Watch very close. Did you see this one come back over here? I cheat, but only a little bit, so you must watch closely. When I put it back over here, you're watching me fumble with my pocket. In reality, it jumps from over there to over here, you see. How many are over here? Do you recall, Marge? Tough None. question? No, no, there's, there, there's one there. <laughs> You'll have to take my word on it. Watch. Was there one there a second ago? Yes. There sometimes is three, but it really doesn't matter. One, two, three. Mm. That's the way Charlie Miller. And it's done. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and now look at how much more magic happens be, before that becomes a thing, Steve. No, I was just going to say that's just such a beautiful sequence. It's it it really arises no suspicion. You know then, what I mean? And then the just, time misdirection continues to yeah. distance it. Like that's so. just going to mess you up so bad in about two minutes. Right, but he could do it right <laughs> this second. I mean? Look at how much more magic happens, including the how about the using one ahead to make the the orange jump from cup to cup. Yeah, I know that was that's just an extra. <laughs> right. As you watch this, y'all, keep out your eye on the moment in this next bit before the reveals where he says, you know, he plays it on top, but he could place it underneath. Now that you know what you know. I like that. There's one other gentleman, and his name was Dr. Jacob Daly. And Dr. Jacob Daly had a most unusual way. He would take all the balls. Now, he could do this, by the way, with the balls on top or with them underneath. Yeah. When he did it with them on top, he put all three in his pocket. Whatever one you touch, they will appear underneath. I guarantee it. With a wand. Oh. It's all right. No? Try another one. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. <laughs> No, it really doesn't matter. You see, this is the first one you touched, was it? See, I could make it appear underneath there. I mean, it's really no problem whatsoever. <laughs> Gets a little bigger, you see. But Jacob Daly, when he did this, he had a wonderful thing. You didn't believe there were trapdoors. Look, it goes right on through the darn trapdoor. I'll do it once again. Look at that. Isn't that the darndest thing you've ever seen? People say, how can you do that? I said, simple, you cheat. Great, 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 great. Yeah, just study, study that sequence. If you're if you're into cups and balls and you want for your final love uh, loads, if you want your final load to be that good, just you you should study that sequence and. That's the sequence I took on, man. It's the best one that there is. I don't think anything even comes close to what Johnny has there. It's the reason to buy those books. In my and when, but isn't that now Johnny said over there's another sequence in there by Jamie Swiss that John said he adopted many years later. Uh, do you prefer I, this sequence? It's very similar, man. I think it's all the same technology. There may be a couple of cleaner edges. There might be a couple edges that were sanded off, but really it's the same. The spirit is the same of the thing. Uh, and at this point, you know, I still think it's John. I mean, I, I know that Jamie probably has some wrinkles on that, but I mean, if John didn't do what he did first, Jamie wouldn't be talking about it. And, you know, but it's semantics to me. I, I think that just look at the routine in the book, look at the routine on this video. I think it's the best sequence that there is. I don't think mm -hmm. anything even, I don't even think there is a second best to this. It's just, and, and you'll never find a better example of what it looks like when it looks like magic you know uh, mm -hmm. egg right. bag and with the cups you'll just never see and of course john was spending so much time after he took a 20-year hiatus he was working in the sewer system in in chicago supporting a family then he went out and he saw vernon at the new magic castle around 65 watched vernon do that close-up set and just the same way you could see the grateful dead in your life changes by the time he left that close-up show 20 minutes later Honey, I'm quitting my job. We're going to California. 
and uh, I'm getting back into show business. He was in his 40s, you know, and, and at that point, you know, in your 40s is widely considered to be, it's like uh, being a, a star tennis player or a star piano player, a concert pianist. There's certain kinds of things they say that you should be younger before you start if you really want to become a virtuoso. But John said, I'm in my 40s. I've got, you know, my family is grown. I need back in, you know, because John was in show business. He was in the circus when he was five years old. You know, what, what's the old line he used to say? It was a true story when he found out that there wasn't a lot of room uh, for an eight year old card cheat. It. Totally true. Yeah. So, so he started essentially at that time when he started to go to the castle in the period where he ended up being Charlie's landlord for all those years. He was not starting from scratch, but he was starting over with passion and built his close up act, his famous stand up act, and it, all of that in just a few years. It's a wonderful story for our members. Because the simple truth is, there is no such thing as too late. Mm -hmm. The minute you decide you care enough that the work doesn't seem so much like work, you can really find uh, aspects and layers to your magic instantaneously as soon as you care, care to look, you know, which is what so many of our members are doing with us. I mean, that's, I think, why Conjure Community uh, brings such wonderful people to it, you know, Adam? Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. So um, we have this last clip that we should watch. So so you've got to see all the old Tom Son or all the old Johnny Thompson, right? Now we're going to get to see Tom Sony. We're going to get to see what happened after he put his full faith into the belief that he would be able to create a, uh, a, a character and, and, and tour the world with this act. And I think this is the act that we all really know him for the, the best. But Man, it sure is good. I saw it when I was just a kid, live on stage. I'll never forget it. This is the act that inspired uh, Lance Burton mm -hmm. and, and all of us, really. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs>
You know, when you look at that, right? It what so back up. Yeah. When everybody wants to do a dove act, right? The first thing they do is they go to Channing Pollock, right? That's like the dove act. That's the one that like everybody watches and that's what they try to emulate. Right. And if you notice the act that John's doing is pretty much that act. Totally. Right. It is almost exactly the same act. It's doves from silks. Then he does the twin production. That double does, tying. Yeah, yeah, that's the twin that's production, amazing. right? Yeah. Then he does the the toss vanish at the end of the silk. I mean, it's it's that. But what John did that's so brilliant is, is he's like, hey, I'm not Channing Pollock. I'm never going to be Channing Pollock. I'm like, I just don't fit that mold. What can I do to make it mine? You know? And he's taken, he's made it just so many bits. Like, never miss an opportunity. Like, the U.S. Steel. On the thing. It's like he's not... He's just wrung every bit of laughter and entertainment out of that he can while still doing all the classic Dove move, you know, Dove production stuff and, and perfectly, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, it, it was, this act inspired me to do Dove magic when I was like 15. It's like, this was the thing where like we would watch and be like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, how do you get there? I yeah. mean, there was, there was another, I mean, I remember bad, I think it was Ballantyne who had like Carl a, Ballantyne. yeah, Carl Ballantyne had like a drunk, he was like a drunk magician on stage and you know, it, it didn't really, it was never really this, but there were a few attempts to sort of get close to what Johnny had done. There was, there was one guy that really started that thing in the fifties, that, that act where it's like the magician in trouble and not noticing that his magic is, failing all around him and it was tom palmer mm. and he was doing doing a comedy act that, that was this and that was the seeds of this so that's where johnny started tom palmer eventually became uh, tony andrewsy for those that are into the bizarre magic that's in a whole other whole other uh, saga there but tom palmer's act basically johnny got permission from tom to do that act and then he just did what steve just said worked it and worked it and worked it and then eventually all these bits came and then he created this whole thing from the ground up just starting with that germ of an idea that it was going to be the magician in trouble for the whole the whole act you know but then he found all those moments because all he's like the butt of the joke throughout the whole thing but it's amazing magic happening all around him, right and it's we're really still amazing. missing a few bits from johnny the bowling ball and the you know there's the still tiny a couple, toilet paper yeah the chinese right. toilet paper yeah. the silverware right but, so like uh does anyone remember the silverware when he would you know the joke was like the silverware would like all fall out of his sleeve, right? Because they were stealing silverware from the gig, you <laughs> yeah. know. And then he turned around, a big silver tray would slang down on the stage from the back of his jacket, 
I mean, well, there's he, so he, many more layers, and and this is still great, and there's even more to it. But he's doing the act for another 40 years after yeah. this, this tape is happening. And what you never get to see, you know, they announced the greatest, the world's greatest Polish prestidigitator, and he does that act with all that now dated comedy. And, mm -hmm. you know, several years ago, I mean, Teller was a year in when we were last out in Las Vegas. Teller made it a mission of his to learn John's entire act. I once went to the Monte Carlo with John and Pam when they were going to do that act on just that act. They weren't doing a full hour uh, in the afternoon and watched them set the show. It took oh. both of them moving for hours, folding and stuffing and prepping oh, yeah. every single bit for that. Ironing. Show. Yeah. By the time he uh, walks out onto that stage, it's more, it's got to be more complex than what you take into combat, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, when that show would end, if he was just doing a cabaret spot, right? Right. That, that would be the end. I mean, of course, Steve's talking about other layers that came later. Um, but then he comes up to the microphone to the speak for the first time. And for the very first time, he's put off this whole weapon we've been watching him use all day. And I can't even do it. You know, he says, thank you very much. Thank you. And he's got this high pitched yeah. Eastern European Polish accent. Right. Thank you very much. And the, and the rest of the act is a talking act, you know, with, uh, you know, things like mentalism, you know, right? What is it? Yeah. Right. Uh, who will marry her? You know, two, two men, who will marry her? Who will be the lucky one? Todd will marry her. John will be the lucky one. You know, you know. So you very interestingly, you, you talked about John's uh, background. What's Pam's background? Well, they I believe they met when they were both in at the new school. They were both uh, in New York. I believe they were in Stella Adler. Oh, uh -huh. or maybe she was in Strasbourg and he was uh, at Stella Adler. But they met in the 50s acting. Oh, that's the during the time with Leah Kazan and Josh Logan yeah. and the whole nine yards. That's so, like that's like when that whole method acting movement in New York City was like huge and, and appearing and in that. the movies, right? Because you had you had you know Tennessee Williams writing screenplays, right? Right. So so the whole thing was really happening. God, I mean, so brilliant, so brilliant. Uh, and let me Pam ask you, was uh, an actress on Hogan's, Hogan's Heroes yeah, because yeah. she used to date Hogan. Oh, I forget his name off the top of my head, but uh, I got his face. Can't think of the name. But... There was a movie about him called Autofocus, which you should yes, watch. You should past. not watch around uh, kids. Bob Crane. Yep. Bob Richard Crane. got it. Yeah. Yes. I yeah. used to love that show. I used Checkered to... past uh, that man has. My, my parents uh, got yelled at me because I was watching Hogan's Heroes and goose stepping around the house when I was six. That would definitely piss off my Jewish parents I too. Got upset. Uh, <laughs> I'm so looking forward to the next time we get to watch some of Johnny's material. You know, just watching John, we can learn so much more about magic just by watching Tom Sony than, you know, learning magic from most sources, right? Steve, I do believe that that music was uh, live. I believe there was a yeah. live orchestra there. Yeah. That time. And he had yeah. orchestrations for all that stuff. And well, there's a whole thing that's going down with him and the drummer, right? And that's right. planned, right? They they work that out so that they get those beats and he's able to look at them disappointed and you know get the laugh from the drummer and so forth. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's all worked out. Yep. Yeah. Cool, man. Today's show is fun, dude. I love yeah. I love watching johnny thompson magic it's, it's great magic yeah it's always it's great it's, you learn something every single time um hey guys thank you very much for joining us today we hope you had fun do us a favor hit the like button below this video it tells youtube that we're doing a good job with these videos and while you're at it there hit that subscribe button as well that way you won't miss anything that we are bringing forth from conjure community in the next few days and if you think about joining a magic club, think about joining Conjure Community. We are the best at what we do. All right. We'll see you uh, next time on Afternoon Astonishment.